Good afternoon and welcome back to another edition of NCIA's Industry Essentials Educational Webinars. For those tuning in for the first time, NCIA's Industry Essentials Webinar Series is our premier digital educational platform featuring a variety of interactive programs, all designed to provide your team timely, engaging, and essential education when and where you need it most. I'm your host, Brian Gilbert, the Deputy Director of Events and Education here at NCIA. And as always, I'm thrilled to kick off another episode of our premier member-driven educational experience inside of our Committee Insights series today. Today, we present the third in our multi-part series on novel minor and synthetic cannabinoids, from lab to label, where we'll explore the myriad of challenges faced by manufacturers, regulators, and consumers in this evolving landscape. In this special session, we'll specifically shine a spotlight on the crucial aspect of consumer safety and truth in labeling when it comes to cannabinoid-infused consumer products. We'll discuss the challenges faced by manufacturers striving to provide transparent and accurate cannabinoid content information to consumers, and we'll also delve into the regulatory landscape and examine how label content requirements can be made both feasible for manufacturers while being effective for regulators. At the heart of this webinar lies a shared commitment to ensure that consumers have access to reliable information, empowering them to make informed choices about the cannabinoid products they consume. So whether you are a manufacturer seeking clarity in labeling requirements, a regulator striving to strike the right balance, or a consumer passionate about transparency and safety, this webinar is tailor-made for you. Together, we'll navigate the complex terrain of cannabinoid product labeling and address the challenges that lie ahead. By fostering collaboration and understanding, we can create a marketplace that prioritizes consumer safety and informed decision-making. So sit back and settle in, get ready to uncover the truth, challenge the status quo, and explore the path towards a better, safer, and more transparent cannabinoid marketplace today. All right, enough with this intro. Let's get this show on the road. To kick things off, I'd like to welcome our moderator for today's program, Paul Koble, technology attorney at Harris Brickens Swawski LLP. I always get that a little messed up, as well as the current chair of NCIA's cannabis manufacturing to the virtual stage. Welcome to NCIA's Industry Essentials. Great as always to have you here today, Paul. Um, I think before we kick things off, you're going to lead the panel through some brief introductions to provide the audience with a little background on their respective companies and their history within the industry. So from here, you can take it away from here, and I'll be able to drive the slide deck based on your verbal, um, your verbal instructions from there. Excellent. Thank you very much, Brian. And welcome, everyone, to uh, this webinar. This, as Brian mentioned, this is the third in a series of webinars focusing on minor novel and synthetic uh, cannabinoids. The 2018 Farm Bill gave rise to a whole new category of cannabinoid products that contain uh, various minor novel and synthetic cannabinoids. Uh, if you're not familiar, I would encourage you to review and, and go back and watch the first two uh, webinars in this series to uh, understand some of the basics of the issues facing um, these new pro this new product category. Um, these are the cannabinoids, other than those that most people are familiar with, Delta-9 and uh, CBD, that are present in various levels in, in cannabis and how all of those cannabinoids are now being incorporated into different types of uh, products. The, the first in this series focused on defining the conversation around minor novel and synthetic cannabinoids. The second webinar, we dove into the actual molecules here and examined what some of these different molecules do, what we know and what we don't know, and what we hope to learn uh, about these molecules as we continue to study them. In this webinar, we're going to be focusing on consumer safety and how consumers should be approaching these, this new product category. And there's two main components that we're going to focus on here uh, around consumer product safety. And those both relate to find, communicating to the consumer the contents of the product. So on the first step, we have uh, testing and being able to quantify and identify the various components of these cannabinoid products um, that are being created. And then the second component of that is how companies uh, can communicate those contents to consumers through labeling and other mechanisms. Uh, the fourth webinar in this series will focus on manufacturing and worker safety. And finally, we'll wrap it all together with a discussion of uh, regulatory issues and how these products should be regulated going forward. 
Uh, here with me, I have four esteemed members of the cannabis industry uh, to discuss some of these issues. Darwin Millard is uh, also known as the Spock of Cannabis and is the Chair Emeritus of the NCIA's Cannabis Manufacturing Committee. Uh, Rana Wu is, a, um, is on the Hemp Committee along with Keith Butler and Matt Johnson joins us from the Risk Management Committee. So I'm gonna hand it off to each of those um, in that order to give a brief introduction about themselves and then we'll dive into um, the issues relating to testing and labeling. So Darwin, please uh, pop your, can your camera on and give us a brief introduction. Hey everyone, how are you today? Super excited to be here, thanks so much, Paul. Uh, Darwin Millard, AKA the Spock of Cannabis. I am the Chief Science Officer for Final Bell, and we are a multinational co-manufacturer for the licensed cannabis manufacturing industry. Uh, super excited to be here uh, to talk about testing and the interdependence of quality data produced by those testing labs and us as product manufacturers and how we rely on that. Also here to, uh, as a member of ASTM International's D37 Committee on Cannabis, and as the, I guess, lead author, technical contact for our, one of our latest standards, uh, D8449 on uh, uh, label content style format location and prominence of elements for consumer products containing cannabinoids. A very, uh, very important new specification. Thank you so much, Paul. Excellent, very topical. Rihanna. So it looks like Rihanna just dropped. I'm troubleshoot. I was just messaging you all in the back end. I'm troubleshooting um, getting her back into the room with her now. So if uh, either Keith or Matthew wanted to jump in with the intro, hopefully Let's we'll have Rihanna circle around. Perfect. Nope, and Keith, you're on mute. We're gonna jump for Keith. All right, hi everyone. My name's Keith Butler. Uh, I am the chair emeritus of the hemp committee. Uh, I've got four decades in the hemp and cannabis industry. Uh, I'm a U.S. and international patent holder on drug delivery methods, and I uh, CEO a company that manufactures and produces products under a variety of names and labels. So um, I'm excited to be here and uh, bring forth some good information so everyone gets a better understanding of how all these minor novel cannabinoids all work and, and what they are. So uh, thanks for having me. Excellent, thank you, Keith and Matt. Hey guys, my name is Matt Johnson. I'm with Quad Score Insurance Services, one of the nation's leading cannabis insurance companies. Uh, I lead our risk management division, helping protect our clients from fire, theft, product liability, and all manner of things that can uh, negatively affect companies in the cannabis industry. Uh, also proud to be a member of the NCIA Risk Management and Insurance Committee, as well as the Claims and Litigation Management Alliance Cannabis Committee. So. Excited to be here and share the, the fun insurance point of view that I know you guys all were so excited to uh, come here and see. Woohoo! <laughs> all right. Thank you, everyone. And when Rihanna jumps back on, we will uh, get her in here to give a uh, introduction of herself. Um, before we get too deep into the weeds, I wanted to do a quick introduction to just how some of these minor novel and synthetic cannabinoids come into being. How are they created and produced in the first place? Um, we have a slide up on uh, the screen here from our various presentations that we've been giving um, on four different pathways. So I'd like to invite um, first Keith and then Darwin to discuss uh, these different pathways for how minor novel and synthetic cannabinoids are created. Keith? Excellent. So, well, as you can see from the screen, there are a variety of different ways to create these uh, minor novel or synthetics. So the uh, non-synthetics will come from the extraction from the plant of the trichomes right at the top of the slide there. That is my personal favorite. And that would be the means in which we normally extract the active ingredients from the cannabis or hemp plant, um, generally through different types of solvents, uh, uh, CO2 or ethanol, methanol, butane, uh, mainly uh, carbon-based solvents to get the active ingredients out of the plant material. So um, now Darwin's gonna be able to talk to the conversion of products more so than I, so I'll jump to modifying an organism because I've got a little bit of uh, expertise in this field too. So there are many ways to, uh, to make this happen, to create a cannabinoid, and one of them is creating an organism 
Um, there are different ways to go from yeast and molds and different substrates, which you can then create an actual single molecule cannabinoid from a substrate that has nothing to do with cannabis to begin with. That is a whole science, which has its own set of patents. Uh, the products are not based in plant material, but other more like funguses um, that can actually convert to something else. And that new method creates an expensive cannabinoid, but a very pure cannabinoid. So then we have the conversions, which is basically the story of what's happened in our hemp industry right now. Um, due to a large glut in CBD isolate, which appeared right after the pandemic began, um, a lot of creative chemists were able to convert that CBD isolate because, well, starting from the beginning, the cannabis or hemp plant starts off as CBGA, which then is converted to all other cannabinoids. So CBD, the isolated form is downstream from that and downstream from the CBD are the TACs. So if you have the right precursors, the right heat and pressure and uh, molecules to cause conversion, you can convert CBD into many other downstream cannabinoids, including Delta-8, Delta-10, THCPO, so on and so forth, what we see in the marketplace today. Um, Darwin is, uh, has a much greater expertise in this than me, so he should really give a good follow-up here. So Darwin, it's all yours, buddy. Oh, well, no, no worries, Keith. Act quite honestly, you, you hit the nail right on the head for all of those things. So yeah, I think it's just important for the listeners, right, that cannabinoids can come from a variety of sources. Uh, they can be extracted and refined, uh, extracted from the plant material and then refined. Uh, they can be converted from one another, uh, and they can even be manufactured in the lab, right? We can just create these things from precursor ingredients and just poof, we've got a cannabinoid. And then, and then of course, we have precision fermentation, uh, as Keith was alluding to with some of these newer uh, novel methods related to genetically modified organisms. Which of these methods, Keith and Darwin, are, we, are, are you presently seen as most uh, prevalent in the marketplace? Is there is there one or a couple of methods that stand out um, as being more commonly used and some that are being less commonly used or are they even across the board? Darwin? Like grab, it just, I, so as a major purchaser of CBD, or sorry, of CBG, my bad there, um, yeah. we get that, believe it or not, our main supplier, it's uh, precision fermentation. Uh, we get the, the bulk of our CBG isolate from, uh, uh, from CBG that is manufactured, uh, produced by yeast. So, and when it comes to some of those more uh, unique novels, that's actually, I think, the, the location we're going to find these more uh, because it's very easy to manufacture. And these things are pretty common, uh, you know, using yeast and other genetically modified organisms to create precursors and other drugs is is not new science that's actually done but for a number of other of common uh, ingredients used in food and pharma. It sure is. Well, I, it, Darwin's 100% right. And so getting back to your question though, so what was most prevalent and what still remains most prevalent in the cannabis industry is extraction. So when people are dealing with the cannabis plant and they're, they have licenses, and they're licensed manufacturers or sellers of the product, they're generally extracting. Now, the hemp industry is a whole nother story. It used to be extraction until the glut of CBD isolate and the pandemic. And from that point forward, it turned into conversion. So I would say there's a good possibility that 90% of the products in the marketplace today are converted cannabinoids as opposed to extracted cannabinoids when found in the intoxicating hemp derivative marketplace, which is the by far the bulk of the current existing marketplace for hemp-based products. So uh, now on the modified organisms like Darwin was talking about, that's a very small portion and that's at the moment reserved for the people who understand the science and have the contacts. Um, that certainly will grow over time, but um, that's a that's a pretty unique, and it really is for those very hard to come by cannabinoids that are more cost effective to manufacture using yeast or other 
uh, organisms to create them from thin air. So, so um, do you see it moving toward the precision, precision fermentation um, avenue in the future, or is uh, there still going to be kind of a, a disparity of different um, processes used? Depends on the marketplace. So the cannabis industry will more than likely stick with extraction. The hemp industry at the moment, until it is regulated away, will stick with conversion. And the pharmaceutical industry or those creating high quality reproducible products will move to the creation out of yeast or fermentation, uh, many of the different methods to create cannabinoids out of non-plant-based material. So it really depends on the marketplace and what is the final output or use of the product. And just to quickly put a nail on that one and uh, nip it in the bud, right? It's, it's, it's actually very complicated to get precision fermentation to work right. Uh, CBG is easy because it's the first one, but there is a uh, synthase pathway that we have to create for every single cannabinoid, which takes a lot of time and effort and, and energy and research to create. So right now, the only bulk amount of any cannabinoid that's done through precision fermentation is CBG, which is why it's available on the market right now at a cost level that makes it work, as Keith said, in comparison to the bulk amount of naturally extracted cannabinoids that are available. Excellent. Thank you. Very true. All right. So now let's, let's move into how these different um, uh, cannabinoids are um, uh, present in the marketplace and their, their effects on testing and labeling. Uh, before we do that, I see that Rhiannon has uh, rejoined our webinar. And so I'm going to um, send it back to her to uh, give us a brief introduction. And then we can um, move into the next question that was slated for uh, Rhiannon, which is what is the role of third party testing in the cannabis and hemp industry? So um, Rhiannon, if you can give us a, a quick introduction and then um, take it away into the role of testing in cannabis. And sure. Thank you. Thanks everyone and thanks for the patience while I dealt with my technical difficulties. Um, so my name is Rhiannon Wu, I'm the co-founder of Trace Trust. We actually are a um, third party auditing organization in the area of cannabis and hemp. So we have worked on um, creating GMP based uh, voluntary standards for different manufacturing facilities to follow. Um, and that comes from our background in applying these same kind of standards to food and beverage, um, broad acreage, agriculture, and other manufacturing processes. We saw how that was really beneficial in those industries and uh, joined the cannabis industry formally in uh, 2016 to bring those, um, those methods into the cannabis industry. And through that, I've had a chance to work with, you know, everyone on this call, obviously, but especially um, Darwin as we work to bring standards out into the marketplace. So um, I'll answer my question because I think I remember it was, um, how does minor synthetic novel cannabinoids integrate into third-party testing? I believe was my question. I was listening. That's right. Yeah. How, talk, <laughs> give us an introduction to how testing of these minor novel and synthetic cannabinoids plays out in the industry currently. So really, from a third party point of view, there's kind of two reasons to do testing. There's the um, state mandated testing, which is established, you know, through the regulation, through the regulations that says like this is the minimum standards for products to be safe. Um, and so someone has to tell the regulators what to test for, or they have to, they have to create testing standards around that. Um, but that should really be considered like the bare minimum of safety in the industry is to test what's legally required to be tested. Um, the other part of third party testing is actually the area where I work more, which is in process validation. So everyone who's out here creating um, cannabinoids through whatever method, extraction, um, conversion or fermentation, they're following some kind of process. And in the best practices, they would use testing as a way to double check their work that they actually follow their process correctly and receive the out products, the finished products that they intended to create. So it would be um, 
a like a self-regulated type of industry. So testing kind of wears these two hats where yes, the state tells you what you minimally must test for, but in an ideal situation, the manufacturer should also be working with their testing labs to validate that their processes are working at a really high level. Excellent. So let's bring Matt in here to talk a little bit about how those testing requirements vary from state to state. What are we looking at um, in, in, you know, say one state versus across state lines in another? Sure. Yeah, the, the testing requirements uh, for regulated cannabis businesses are generally pretty straight and pretty uniform. Uh, you're often going to see that the products have to be tested in an ISO 17025 certified laboratory. You're going to have to test for a uh, you know, half dozen common things, things like mycotoxins, residual solvents, uh, heavy metals, pesticides, uh, so on and so forth, they, along with your cannabinoid content and a terpene profile, depending on the state. Uh, the hemp industry and uh, some of these converted products we've been talking about uh, are not really subject to those same requirements. So we see this sort of double standard where, uh, you know, the licensed cannabis businesses or, or marijuana businesses, if that helps eliminate confusion, uh, have a, a much higher cost of compliance. Uh, they've got not only the, the licenses and fees and higher taxes that they're paying, but they also have to uh, get these uh, tests done on every uh, you know, batch of products that they want to put out and sell to the public. Whereas a lot of these kind of hemp companies converting many of the same cannabinoids or other intoxicating cannabinoid products from CBD isolate or lemons, apparently, uh, blows my mind. Uh, you know, they're not subject to those same rules and requirements. So there's a, a potential gap created there in terms of, uh, you know, consumer safety when it comes to will the average American consumer understand the difference between a lab tested product from a licensed marijuana business or, uh, you know, some synthetically converted uh, CBD that is now a, a Delta 8 THC vape pen they bought in a gas station. So uh, it really kind of diverges even more greatly when you get into the, the labeling requirements on a state-by-state -state basis. You've got 40 different sets of requirements for medical and recreational markets. Uh, and fortunately, there are some really bright people out there working to, to change that and uh, help bring a bit of uniformity, not just to the United States, but to the uh, international cannabis scene. So with that, I'll, I'll let you kind of transition over to the, the labeling discussion. That, that's an excellent segue into, into the labeling, because as I mentioned at the beginning of this, right, there are two components to, con to um, communicating to consumers what these products contain. One is identifying and quantifying it through the testing. And the second is how do we communicate those, those results uh, to consumers in an effective and efficient um, and honest method. So um, Darwin, why don't you jump in here? Because I know that you have um, done a ton of work for ASTM <laughs> Um, in the labeling uh, in the labeling components. So what do, what do the current labeling standards look like um, for these minor novel and synthetic cannabinoid products? And how are those standards affected by the current uh, testing landscape? Great questions. Yeah, and absolutely. I appreciate getting an opportunity to talk about some of the efforts and work that we've been doing over at ASTM International's D37 Committee on Cannabis. But you know, the current landscape when it comes to label standards, right, which are different from regulations, especially in this particular marketplace is that, that until recently, there were none. But luckily, um, as of last year, D8441, that's letter D as in Douglas, 8441, is a new standard uh, symbol for identifying uh, consumer products containing intoxicating cannabinoids. So we've been talking about a universal symbol here in the United States for quite some time, but we seem to have 35 boutique marketplaces, each one with a universal symbol, <laughs> which is hard to convey that same information, consistent information uh, to the consumer of a warning, right, about this particular product if that symbol, if that icon changes from marketplace to marketplace. And not only does it, is it difficult to make sure that that information is being conveyed correctly. It's expensive. You have multiple different colors to have to deal with. All of these costs are burdensome to the manufacturer, and they all impact whether or not 
like the manufacturer is going to comply as well, especially if we're talking about hemp derived products and trying to cross the line between marijuana and hemp. So what's great is that we have the first ever international label, uh, <clears throat> first ever established true international uh, symbol for identifying consumer products that contain intoxicating cannabinoids. And following up from that was the first ever set of internationally harmonized label content specifications. So what type of information should be presented on the label and where? And that is all super critical because as you were saying, we need to make sure that we can convey consistent information to the consumer, whether that's in an adult use marketplace or in a medicinal use marketplace, so that those consumers can make informed purchase decisions. And in those cases where they are indeed a patient or they are a medical professional trying to make a dosage recommendation, they have information to do so. Currently, there's an utter lack of consistency and standardization of the information that's presented on those labels. And why that's impacted by testing is because there's also inconsistent requirements in regards to how to present the cannabinoid content of that product on the label. So again, if your content, the actual information that should be on that label is different, if how you, the format, like whether or not it's in a percentage or milligrams per gram, if that's different as well, then again, the consumer starts to not really understand the information you're trying to convey to them. And all, for all of us on the call, we know it's complicated enough to deal with serving sizes, doses, et cetera. To have to dumb that down for the everyday consumer can be difficult enough while complying with all of these various different labeling requirements that exist from state to state. So we're hoping that uh, this new label specification can be that mechanism to help harmonize and, you, and uh, I guess, make all this various different uh, information is more consistent so that we can improve, as I say, uh, consumer safety and information. Excellent. And if anyone wants to participate in that standard setting uh, process, what's the ASTM um, committee information as well, Darren? Yeah, of course. I will put it in the chat, uh, but it's ASTMcannabis.org. And that's the microsite dedicated to our technical committee which will bring you up to speed on everything we're doing. Excellent, thank you very much. And you know, as, as will be clear throughout this webinar, the previous webinars, the webinars to follow, you know, labeling and clear communication between manufacturers and consumers and regulators is a key issue in this new product category. It's something that we all have to face and we all have to kind of approach with good faith and uh, you know, consumer safety in mind. Um, so with that in mind, Darwin just gave us kind of a great rundown in, in the current way that we're um, approaching uh, labeling issues. Brian, can we move to the next slide in this? Um, on the screen here, we have uh, one of the other issues that kind of intersect between uh, testing and labeling. And that is uh, a lot of these byproducts of cannabinoid synth synthesis that can occur in all of the different um, processes that are currently registering in, in third-party testing as unknowns um, or that are unavailable to be quantified. So I'm wondering if any one of you can touch on or um, discuss some of the interdependence on testing labs and product manufacturers um, for the need for quality data in the space. I'll Very throw well. out to start with. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Keith. You go, you go, go first. ahead, and then Ryan, and we'll go to you. Okay, so I'll throw out to start with, I've been doing this for a long time and I have yet to ever see two labs provide the same information on the same product. And it is, it's terrible. So you literally, one lab has a higher THC content, content than another lab and another lab has a higher CBD and one lab quantifies Delta-8 very well. One can't quantify it at all. And this is consistent throughout our industry. So um, Rihanna is, uh, is in that part of the business, so she should be much more knowledgeable about it. But out there in the working world doing this, I've never seen two, two of these COAs match. And I would love to be able to see them match. So Rihanna. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's probably one of the things that we all would like to see is more 
especially those of us sitting as panelists on this call, we'd like to see more standardization um, in the methods that are used. But I'll just kind of describe some of the, the things that are challenging for, for the lab's point of view. There are constantly evolving production methods, constantly evolving reagents that are being used, new technologies being introduced all the time. And when you have a industry that's constantly evolving, the industry that tests the output of that has to constantly evolve with it and in integration and, and through clear communication. So for example, if you are expecting the lab to know what these spikes may represent when you're not telling them what reagents you're using for them to uh, you know, predict, oh, which um, metabolites might these be based on what the starting material was, they can make educated guesses, but if you're not a partner in the process, there's going to maintain these unknowns. And so this is where like when I was talking in the previous question about the two sides of third-party testing, there's what the states require, but they can only require what they know about. And so they're always going to be the slowest. They are always learning about things years after everybody else. The people who know the most about the change in landscape of the industry are the manufacturers. So the manufacturer has to communicate to the lab, I've changed my production process. I'm using this machine instead. I'm using this reagent instead. I'm using this starting material instead. How is this altering what we're seeing in the, in the, um, the mass spec? How is this altering what we're seeing in the readings and working together in a partnership in that? And then both of those people, those parties need to work together with the state to say, you're regulating cannabis from 10 years ago. You got to get with the program, state regulators. You got to constantly evolve what you're asking for um, because otherwise it opens this major loopholes where people only, um, they're passing the test because they are, the test question is asking the wrong question, right? They're not testing for the things that are dangerous today. They're take, testing for the things that were dangerous 10 years ago. And so everyone has to be working in partnership together. The other thing that makes us very, very difficult with the, the ever-changing manufacturing side of our industry is that the labs also are in this situation where their test method is their IP. And so, their ability to standardize with the lab across the street is very in jeopardy because if they standardize with the lab across the street, then their method's not their IP anymore. So it creates a really hard situation for lab standardization if we don't have organizations like ASTM really working at a higher level to create those standardizations. Darwin, did you have any uh, anything to add on the need for data in the testing space? Well, sure. The only thing I would add is that as a product manufacturer who we don't have an internal lab, right? So we, we're heavily dependent on that third-party data, critical to make sure that we meet our compliance testing, as Rihanna was saying. Um, so it's very important that we have a good relationship with our lab in order to make sure that we're confident in their confidence intervals <laughs> and, the, and the data that they're producing um, so that we can make sure that we are uh, meeting our, our state and regulatory requirements related to testing. So it's, it's, I think Rihanna really hit the nail on the head regarding trying to standardize a test method. And it really comes from the top down, having the states take a more proactive role and require say a test method a sample preparation practice, uh, a column, you know, a mobile phase, and that will help to yeah, that'll help to eliminate these issues we see, you know, test shop, uh, lab shopping, et cetera, all these variable different testing. Um, but it'll also take it'll provide more uh, support to our testing members, to our labs out there. It'll show that they're not just making stuff up. It's not just crazy numbers. This is this is real data that you must rely on to make safe products for the industry. I'd like to throw something out there too on this unknown, the number seven. Um, a lot of the laboratories that I've spoken to say that whenever there is a conversion taking place of cannabinoids, you're converting CBD to something else. 
that new cannabinoids pop up or unidentifiable cannabinoids, which we are unaware of yet and we don't have any specifications for. So in some instances, that's what these number seven unknowns are on this slide is something that was created as a result of the conversion process, which is a direct result of the catalyst that was used. And that goes back to what Rihanna said that we need to know what those catalysts are and the manufacturers are keeping them proprietary that, well, this is how we made our THCP and we're not telling anybody. So there's a giant disconnect because those catalysts are causing these new compounds which didn't exist in nature yesterday and we don't know what to call them or how to quantify them. Right, I think it's it's really important when we see a graph like this with you know several different peaks of unknowns in there that to, to recognize that they don't have to be unknown. It's not that we are incapable of identifying or quantifying what these um, these different constituents are. It's just that the the information is is not there in the testing lab um, oftentimes to know what to test for or to know what standards to run it past in order to identify these different compounds. And so uh, a lot of it is it's communication. It's it's communication between um, you know the the manufacturer, the testing labs regulators and consumers. And um, you know that's what we're talking about when we are delving into this new product category. Um, we, we've spent a lot of time focusing on, on what this looks like from the manufacturer's point of view. I wanna turn it a little bit and talk about how uh, consumers are interacting with these types of products. Um, I had an interesting experience. I was in uh, Des Moines, Iowa a couple of uh, weeks ago um, and went into one uh, dispensary that is in downtown Des Moines. Now, Iowa does not have a uh, adult use uh, cannabis program and their medical use is uh, very limited. So this is was somewhat of a novelty. Line around the corner um, and I went in and, and kind of looked around. They had the usual um, edibles uh, with all advertising with Delta 9, THC, um, some with other cannabinoids, CBN, uh, CBG were in there. Um, and, but one of the other more interesting product categories they had was, was flour. Um, and I asked them about their flour with relatively high THC percentages in the you know, mid 20s. Um, and I asked them how they got there. And they said that they started with high THC A flour and then uh, stirred it in a high heat uh, environment, three to 400 degrees to decarboxylate the THC A into Delta 9 THC. Um, so, it was their position that all of these products were legal and authorized under the 2018 Farm Bill. We're not going to get into that on this particular <laughs> webinar. Um, that is an entire webinar that we have uh, saved for the fifth one. But what I'd like to know, talk about here is, first, how do consumers know that these products are safe to consume? <laughs> Let's start with Keith. Sure. Uh, simplest question is, or answer is, they don't. Um, there are no safety profiles whatsoever on these compounds. We have no historical data. Um, I was in a store the other day, and now there is a Delta 11, and there was a Delta M, and there was a Delta X. And I'm standing there going, I don't even know what these things are. So how on earth am I going to know what the safety profile is? And we're still doing studies on CBD and regular THC. I mean, we've just begun on these basic compounds. So... I, I don't know of any companies that have gone through a clinical trial or pharmacokinetics or anything on any of these exotic converted cannabinoids. They appear to be manufactured to make profit. And in many instances, they're sold in tobacco stores, which the consumers aren't really looking for a safety profile. They're looking for a buzz. So they come in and if these synthetic compounds give them the buzz they're looking for, no one's asking questions about what the long-term health negatives or positives are. Um, they're just not asking questions. And it's concerning to me, but that, that's the world we live in, though, and, and many of the consumers that are buying it versus a, a high-end dispensary or a health food store where people are coming in with a completely different approach or different attitude towards their health and the things they ingest. So uh, that's what I'm seeing being out there you know, on the front lines every day on both manufacturing and retail, because we do also have a retail store. So uh, that's what I see in the world. Excellent. Darwin, what are your thoughts on how consumers can, uh, you know, read these labels and whether or not they can trust uh, the labels to be informed about the products that they're buying and consuming? Yeah, for sure. It's just like, 
to pick it back up what Keith is saying, right? Is a lot of these labels or uh, uh, the intent of the product is kind of makes sense, right? So like Keith was saying, if the product's being sold in like a tobacco store, you kind of know that that's not necessarily safe, right? For in that respect, because uh, you're not consuming it to for a, a health issue. But a lot of these products are being sold as say dietary supplements or otherwise, right? And sometimes they look like other traditional or established products you see on the marketplace. Uh, depending on the manufacturer, there are some really good, uh, uh, there are good operators out there and bad operators. And the best operators, right, they're fully compliant with federal uh, labeling regulations. And their products look exactly like a normal consumer product, which is great. A, because a consumer is familiar with that type of information. Um, and B, because that means that they're doing their due diligence to, to provide the as much information as needed. But that does provide an interesting catch-22, with especially with these hemp-derived cannabinoids that are being sold in uh, pretty much your over-the-counter anywhere, uh, the gas station, you know, Whole Foods, et cetera. You, you kind of name it, you'll find a store or more, say, a legitimate retail outlet that's selling these products. And what happens is you have consumers, rightly or wrongly, automatically assume because they're in their normal uh, uh, consumer product store, they're at the Whole Foods, they're at the GMC or wherever, uh, or even at the 7-Elevens or other gas stations, right? They, that they immediately assume because they're there, that means they follow all of the other consumer safety protocol uh, requirements that every other product that is on the shelf has to follow. And as Keith was saying, that is just simply not the case. So in some of these cases, while the labels may have good information, that might not necessarily give the consumer enough assurances of the safety of the product. 100% correct. Americans believe if it's on the shelf of a store, that it's safe. We've, we've all been brought up to believe that. And that's a misnomer in our industry because of the how new it is because the the non-regulatory pathway from a federal level because ASTM is not implemented across the across the industry of a lot of reasons but consumers in America just believe that if it's for sale it's safe I think that'll and, be uh, a running theme Darwin and, and Keith uh, of these podcasts that uh, consumers should exercise a little bit of healthy skepticism um, in this product category I, uh, well, I, I want to invite you in to uh, maybe issue spot some of the risk uh, management uh, issues with a, um, a a dispensary that is so focused on minor novel and synthetic uh, hemp derived cannabinoids. Yeah, I've got uh, really three key issues that, that go with that, but Rihanna, it sounded like you were about to say something. No, I'm gonna give you, a you go ahead and then I'll go after you. Okay. Uh, so in the, the hemp-derived intoxicating cannabinoid space, again, we've already touched on this being a, a widely unregulated market with minimal oversight from uh, any sort of regulatory body uh, and, and minimal self-regulation too, although uh, you are starting to see the emergence of some good actors, if you will, who are adhering to the strict testing methods and uh, making their production processes clear. Uh, that said, it's certainly not the majority of them out there. So I see three key issues. Uh, First is going to be copycat packaging. Uh, everyone's seen the, you know, Stonios, whatever, knockoff Oreos package that claims to have 600 milligrams of Delta-8 THC, uh, but it's very much so in the trade dress of a common, uh, you know, household. So what's going to stop a, a reasonable consumer from saying, oh, well, these are just regular Oreos, or oh, well, it looks like Oreos gotten into the cannabis market. After all, we've seen the Jones Soda Company get into cannabis beverages, so... Perhaps it is feasible that food and beverage will join the, the cannabis space. Uh, copycat packaging not only brings these kind of trade dress, trademark, copyright infringement issues, uh, but you also get you know, issues with unintended consumption and appealing to minors, uh, which are items we really want to crack down on building a, a responsible cannabis industry. Uh, the, the other two areas I would outline as, as big issues uh, are going to be you know, bad additives. Uh, and this is something we, we've seen even in the regulated cannabis space, right, with the vitamin E acetate uh, crisis back in 2019, where people were putting supposedly a harmless additive into the product, but 
when it's used in an unintended fashion, it can produce some very poor health effects. So vitamin E acetate, totally common in beauty products, totally safe to apply on your skin, has been, you know, had all the safety profiles done and so on and so forth. Uh, but the moment you put it in a vaporizer cartridge and inhale it into your lungs, you can really do some bad things to yourself. Uh, similarly, we've seen some herbal additives used in traditional medicine that uh, in larger concentrations can be linked to uh, the failure of certain organs. So try to avoid anything that just is tied to an unknown or some exotic plant that you acquired in the woods of the Amazon, right? Uh, the, the third issue is going to be accountability and product recalls, right? Uh, do you know who's manufactured those infused Oreos that are, are being sold at the gas station? Do you really know where they came from? Uh, if someone comes to you that after the day after buying them and says, hey, I got really sick or hey, you know, my cousin's in the hospital, how are you going to be able to, you know, call up that company and say, hey, you've got to, you know, help pay for their medical bills. Uh, is your insurance going to cover this? How are you going to, you know, handle this? Uh, and, and, you know, Product recalls. I've never heard of a product recall for Delta 8 gummies, right? You know, I think they just kind of mail them out. And like you said earlier, the customers aren't looking for safety. They aren't looking for a wellness product. They're looking for a buzz. Uh, and, and no one's really watching their back to make sure it's a safe buzz. And there's a you know bigger argument you could you could have and say point a finger at big alcohol or big tobacco or, or heck uh, fast food and say, you know, none of these things come with a, a safety warning. Well, Sure, but uh, we have the opportunity to build this industry the right way and uh, put some of those best practices out there before we see uh, a lot of adverse health effects. And I, I think it's absolutely uh, the right choice for us to do so. Uh, again, I, I'm just glad we've got folks uh, involved here who are helping the, to create the standards uh, at a higher level that hopefully will influence state uh, you know, medical markets, recreational markets, and eventually the federal government uh, into creating sensible testing, labeling, and uh, ingredient requirements for these products. So I've got a lot of feelings. Yeah. You can't tell. Yeah. Um, I'll actually hop onto that. One of the things that I was going to talk about was we don't have to wait for the regulatory agencies to act. Um, you know, it's not one of those things that's very well known, but the food and beverage industry was primarily self-regulated until about seven years ago, because the last federal regulation was 80 years old. So if you can think about how much life has changed in the last 80 years, the food and beverage industry didn't sit around waiting for the FDA's laws to catch up to where we were. They said, no, you need to have best practices. You need to have trained personnel. They got together and formed coalitions to establish what those best practices mean. So, I mean, I guess this is turning into a commercial for everyone to join uh, Darwin at ASTM, but it's really the way that we take the steps to protect ourselves and this industry now and not wait for the, you know, not wait for the laws to catch up. And like one of the things that helps bridge that is like when you establish a consensus standard where, you know, a lot of important people come together and agree that this is really the best thing that we can do, then we're able to kind of like, you know, ASTM as a standard writing organization, you know, insurance as how you manage risk, third party certification as you show that people are following what they're supposed to do. The whole industry rises up and, you know, like I said, food and beverage did this on their own because they had some really scary things happen. You know, lots, you know, the uh, Jack in the box hamburger issue. A lot of people got really sick. Some people died. So the industry said, Hey, we can't have that again. Let's like act on our own best interests. And it would be my wish that maybe we don't wait until somebody dies and we just act in our own best interest now because we know we should. Um, but in the meantime, you know, I'm sure Matt can tell you all kinds of scary things that your insurance company is not going to cover if you're not doing things on the up and up. And Matt, I'm going to pitch that to you in just a second to to talk about some of these these risks to business owners. And Rihanna, that's a great intro into kind of our last uh, section about what the industry and uh, regulators can do um, to further consumer safety. But before I, I get into this, I wanted to make a plug to all of the audience that we will stick around to answer some questions 
um, if we have any. So please drop any questions you have into the Q&A um, board and we will uh, allot at least five minutes at the end. Um, and in the past, we'll stick around to answer more questions if, if we've got time to do so. So um, please drop us any questions that you have uh, and we'll answer as many as we can. Um, Matt, let's go back and before we get into what some of the best practices are, Talk to us a little bit about what are some of the risks are to business owners in this product category. What have people gotten sued for or otherwise in trouble for? Yeah, so this is a, another area where you get uh, a bifurcation between the you know regulated marijuana industry and the, the less regulated hemp industry. So in the, the marijuana industry, uh, we're seeing more, uh, you call it product recall claims, uh, maybe some product liability related lawsuits alleging, uh, you know, inflation of test results or, you know, unintended uh, consequences of consuming a certain product. Uh, when you get more into the, the hemp space, you, you're dealing with some of those issues I highlighted before, right? We've seen handy companies suing cannabis companies for, you know, stealing their trade dress and packaging, uh, damaging their, their brand's goodwill. Uh, we've seen plenty of, uh, you know, it's funny too, because the, the hemp companies will have some of their issues sorted in a federal court, uh, since hemp and its derivatives are currently viewed as federally legal, right? Uh, whereas, you know, none of these issues have ever made it beyond a, a state court for the, the proper regulated marijuana industry. Uh, but you get just all kinds of nasty lawsuits if you aren't doing things by the book. Uh, so we definitely encourage our clients uh, and, and, you know, even some of the folks we won't ensure we're happy to put out, you know, good guidelines around uh, should be making your products in a GMP certified facility. You should be using ISO certified testing labs. You should be uh, working with, uh, you know, the right attorneys to ensure that you're putting the proper labeling disclosures on your products and, and only selling them in the appropriate venues. Uh, you know, the, the cannabis industry is unique in that it started with a, a very high level of uh, compliance, a lot of barriers to entry and a lot of red tape to deal with. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it's very important to make sure that you do uh, just that and, and comply with all of the bureaucratic requirements, most of which are, are put there for people's safety. Uh, we can argue about some of those, but uh, those are the ones I'm concerned with. Excellent. Thanks. I appreciate that. Um, and just as an aside uh, myself, because I would be remiss if I didn't take the opportunity as a trademark um, attorney, that it is never okay to use the trademark and trade dress of another company um, to market your product, whether it is a famous company and you're trying to play off that in the cannabis space or just another company that um, you want to use to attract consumers. That is always a bad idea. And if you need um, further Convincing of that, let me know and I will be happy to uh, do so. All right, so um, let's move into some of the best practices. What can the industry do to uh, make to raise the level of consumer safety in the minor novel and synthetic um, cannabinoid industry? Um, we've got some uh, bullet points on the um, screen here that we had previously put together, but I'm gonna kind of toss it to each of our panelists here to uh, talk about what they think would be the most beneficial um, steps to raising the, the consumer safety in, in the industry. Um, so Keith, let's start with you. Uh, well, there's all of the things on the, on the screen right now are needed, but what, what gets me the most is I'm out there all the time in all different types of stores from regulated cannabis dispensaries. My products are sold from that level all the way down to the tobacco store level. And I, I walk into a tobacco store and I might see a product that says 6,000 milligrams THC. And then when I drill it down to find out what that really is, it's 6,000 milligrams of all the cannabinoids combined, trying to make it look like it's 6,000 milligrams of THC. So what we truly need is honesty in packaging and labeling, which comes through the Federal Trade Commission. Um, it is illegal to improperly labeled products. That's why American consumers believe everything is safe because it's literally against the law to put a product out there that doesn't explain and describe exactly what's in it. But our industry, for some reason, the bad players, they don't know anything about these regulations or they just avoid them and don't follow them. So uh, my number one thing would be more self-regulation. It appears to me that a giant part of 
the industry is not self-regulating and they're only in it for profit and they're not doing what I would consider a requirement to be a responsible manufacturer. So uh, that to me is the biggest problem is just not telling the truth and trying to place marketing on a package when you in fact are selling an intoxicant or a wellness product that's based around unsubstantiated claims or mistruths. Um, I see that every day. So. Matt, what are your uh, takeaways for what the industry can do? Test your products, label them clearly, don't make claims that aren't true. And uh, Paul, you said it well, do not use someone else's branding. Just not yeah. yeah, ever. Uh, yeah. Honestly, there are very few hard and fast rules, but that should be one of them. It, it is one of them. People just don't follow it. <laughs> true. Very true. Rhiannon. Yeah, I mean, I think embracing third party on both sides of it, not just what you're legally required to do, but also as a way to demonstrate that you do follow best practices. There's third party um, certifications like, like GMP certification. If, uh, if the industry did a little bit of co-marketing and really talked up why that's good, then the consumer would know more about it. I mean, most consumers, you could say the word GMP to them and they don't know what it is. So we're a little bit like the organic standard in 1981. We have to do a little bit of marketing together to talk about why this is important, why they should look for it and get that ball rolling. Thank you. All right, Darwin, let's toss it to you to uh, close it out with your thoughts, unless we have um, additional questions coming through the Q&A panel. Yeah, for sure. And I, I, I did respond as well, because I mean, it's best practices, right? And tools and other things industry can use. It's, it's a little nebulous when there are, there are honestly a lot of tools and best practices that the industry should be adopting, right? Just because we threw cannabinoids into these products, all of a sudden it's kind of special and new when you know, there are defined best practices. We've talked about good manufacturing practices, GMP, right? A lot of people like to throw around that particular acronym. But what does that really mean when it really depends on who the end consumer is, right? Are you going to follow a pharma GMP when you just want to make a... Uh, uh, a THC uh, cigarette, basically, if you just want to get people to you know, uh, smoke a nice marijuana cigarette, do you, do you want to follow 21 CFR uh, 210 for an active pharmaceutical ingredient? Probably not. But what, you know, but there isn't really a defined GMP for tobacco products, because there's a strong tobacco lobby. <laughs> so we get to kind of create and make this new avenue for these particular products. So uh, the lack of a better way of throwing it back to helping us help you create those best practices. I think there are a lot of things we could use in industry. A lot of these bullet points talk about test methods. Test methods are critical, right? But it's those only go so far if the authorities having jurisdiction don't choose to use one set of test methods and require that going down. That said, if our industry is proactive, and can be, say, form a coalition willing to endorse and adopt certain test methods and then recommend those on industry that, hey, these, uh, say, the Cannabis Beverages Association or the Hemp Beverage Association come together, for instance, and say, we want to use these test methods and we're going to endorse these test methods. That would be massive having, because as Rihanna said, we don't want to wait for FDA and other regulators to finally pull their head out of the sand. We want to be proactive. We want to put these frameworks in place so they can see, A, we're a functional market, we're mature, and we want to stay around because we're self-regulating to a bunch of different standards that we've defined, uh, whether those be label specifications, which of course are critical to informing the consumer on what they're about to consume so that they can make that informed purchase decision, or if it's a test method to ensure that that data and those claims that were made on that label are actually true and accurate. Um, without those things, you know, that's where we're gonna have problems. So those tools are critical and I would look forward to helping having people help us create those tools going forward. Excellent. 
Well, thank you very much to all of our panelists today. It's been a fantastic conversation. Um, to our audience members, if you've uh, you know, heard something here that you want to participate in this conversation or policy going forward, um, you know, Darwin has put in the chat how you can uh, join or participate in the ASTM uh, standards development process. And I will toss it back to Brian to talk about uh, how you can participate in uh, the NCIA. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much, Paul, for your, your continued leadership um, working amongst this collaboration to produce and execute these programs. I think program or edition number three today was a perfect sort of lead, lead into sessions four and five that we have here up on the screen. Um, dates are still being finalized with some amazing panelists that we're going to be working with across each of our different committees as well. So follow this link that I'll pop in the chat room as well so that all of you all can sign up for our newsletters where you'll be the first ones to know about when sessions four and five are scheduled later this month and early next month and how you all can continue to participate in this amazing collaboration and conversation. Um, with that, I just want to thank all of our amazing panelists for presenting their perspectives on today's panel. I was taking a lot to note, lots of notes here myself um, and definitely have a lot of takeaways on where we can continue to carry this conversation moving into sessions four and five and how we could potentially continue on um, this collaboration like Darwin mentioned, um, forming a larger sort of industry-wide perspective here on what we can do, how we can best position ourselves um, for in pending federal regulation, um, and also how we can ensure that there is actual truth in labeling all the way across the supply chain for manufacturers, regulators, and most importantly, for consumers as well. Um, so thank you all so much for presenting today's program. Um, with that, I'm going to close out today's program by just giving you all a heads up on some other activities that NCIA has coming up how you can learn more about all of the amazing networking and educational events that our organization has been conducting over the last six months um, and what we have sort of potentially uh, up in the air for fall and winter. So um, I know a lot of you all here in the audience pool, I recognize a lot of your all's names from the name tags were amongst the 1200 attendees that joined us across eight different markets these past five months. We saw over 400 plus members of NCIA join us for all of these amazing events that kicked off in January and culminated with our 11th annual Cannabis Industry Lobby Days in Washington, D.C. Um, stay tuned for a bunch of coverage that's going to be coming out and trickling out in our newsletter and blog posts over the next few weeks, chronicling the success of those programs and how all of that influenced the amazing work that we were able to conduct on your behalf and with all of your all's help in Washington, D.C. last month. Um, just a quick shout out to all the platinum sponsors for all of those events, our amazing silver sponsors, our advocate sponsors, as well as our allied association partners and our venue partners that helped us execute these events nationwide. Um, like I said, we will be releasing more details on how you can get involved and support the continuation of these networking and educational events in whatever form they take later this fall and winter by heading to um, the cannabisindustry.org slash events or reaching out to our business development team at any time um, via sponsorship at the cannabisindustry.org. All right. And with that, we'll close today out as we always do with our end of event credit sequence sort of highlighting all of the amazing member businesses that make NCIA's work possible each and every day. This credit sequence will specifically focus on the 65 companies that signed on to support all of those networking, educational, and advocacy focused events throughout Q1 and Q2. So the panelists are going to leave the stage along with the NCIA staff. We're going to head back into the backstage to debrief about today's amazing program. With that, thank you again, Paul, Keith, Darwin, Matthew, and Rhiannon for presenting today's program. We'll see you all next time and look forward to having all of the participants joining us for sessions four and five later this month and next. So with that, thank you all so much. We'll see you next time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.